I am very excited to be introducing uh, Sam Osarbotham as the John Locke Distinguished Lecturer today. Um, if you were to ask any EP who the smartest person in our field is, uh, they would probably reply, you mean besides me? Uh, but after that, there's just such a universal respect for Sam as one of the giant intellectuals of electrophysiology. And I think it's because he's just such a great teacher and his amazing ability to explain complex topics in simple ways. Uh, among many honors, he's won distinguished teaching awards from the Heart Rhythm Society and the American College of Cardiology, as well as the Mayo Clinic Distinguished Educator Award where he works. Uh, when I asked his administrative assistant uh, for a copy of his CV to introduce him, her response was that the file was quite large and perhaps I wanted the one page version instead, uh, which was still really dense with information. Sam is the James M. and Lee S. Van Professor in Cardiology at the Mayo Clinic with joint appointments in pediatric cardiology, physiology and biomedical engineering and anatomy. He's vice chair for innovation in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. He's medical director of the EP lab. He's EP fellowship director. He was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and has approximately 50 US patents and over 500 peer reviewed articles, books, chap uh, book chapters, editorials. Um, Sam, thanks so much for coming today, at least virtually, to be our Locke lecturer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jordan. So it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, topic that I thought we'll go over today and we'll leave plenty of time for some questions is VF ablation from a cardiology, cardiologist general care for a cardiology patient perspective. So is there such a thing? What is the basis? Uh, what are the times that uh, we can make a good case for a VF ablation to be of value to a patient and some things looking forward to the future. So uh, I won't be discussing any specific product or uh, that I'm involved with uh, uh, as an inventor or developing. It's just a general talk introducing the, the field and uh, some patient examples. If something comes up, during the question time, uh, I'll point out any potential conflicts. So just scope of the problem as cardiologists and definitely in EP were aware of this, uh, up to 400,000 in a year, patients die suddenly and the vast, vast majority are cardiac sudden deaths. Many of these patients had no idea of this being a possibility. And when recordings are available by chance wearing a monitor uh, from first responders on the scene, about three quarters, it's ventricular fibrillation. Now, of course, the major breakthrough, uh, Nobel Prize winning breakthrough is the implantable cardiac defibrillator. But the issues that come up with a defibrillator is it does not prevent sudden death. And given the issues of painful shocks, ways to prevent specifically ventricular fibrillation. A lot that we've seen with ventricular tachycardia, are they transferable to ventricular fibrillation or are there unique mechanisms, unique targets that need to be considered? And that's the scope of our discussion. So any of you who've taken care of a patient uh, with an ICD and shocks, especially if they were inappropriate shocks, but also if they were life-saving, but there were multiple happened over a, within a day or over a course of a few days, the patient is never quite the same. It's a, there is a psychological impact. They dread shocks. They start doing less with worry of provoking a shock, and sometimes can take years, if at all, to try to overcome it. So while we could consider advising patients for the ICD purely for management of VF, it's mostly a backup option. And we do what we can in terms of substrate, general cardiology care, heart failure care, coronary care, to minimize the chance that they will get ventricular fibrillation. But despite these, some patients get episodes of ventricular fibrillation. 
And is there an invasive approach, an ablative approach for this? So we kind of, to think about uh, approaches for VF prevention, we think very similarly as we do with any arrhythmia. For any arrhythmia to occur, there almost always has to be some trigger, something, an extra beat, a PVC uh, that brings about the arrhythmia. But that same trigger doesn't produce the arrhythmia unless there is a substrate. There's an underlying bad soil substrate that allows that trigger to bring about the arrhythmia, in this case, ventricular fibrillation. And even with that substrate being there all the time, and that trigger coming up at a given moment may not give rise to VF. So some modulator, something that allows this perfect storm to occur at a particular time. So those are the basic three, the triad of mechanistic basis for ventricular fibrillation. Then any therapeutic option should look to address these. Can we ablate the triggers? Can we ablate the substrate? Can we ablate to change the modulating mechanisms? The most work and what's right now part of ablation approaches is trigger related. So here, this is the key type of tracing. This is from a early paper from Bordeaux that brought attention to the syndrome of PVC-triggered ventricular fibrillation. So the key features here are, even though we recognize some sinus beats, we recognize this kind of chaotic ventricular fibrillation, there is an intervening beat. Transitioning from sinus into ventricular fibrillation just doesn't occur directly but there's an intervening beat, which is a recognizable PVC. And what makes this syndrome unique is there are times when you get the PVC, but you don't get the ventricular fibrillation. So a Holter monitor, bedside monitoring for patients admitted to the hospital, occasionally just in a random electrocardiogram, you may recognize these prototypical PVCs sometimes giving rise to brief runs of a polymorphic VT or ventricular fibrillation. So if this beat occurs at that transition, the question that's been addressed now for the last 10, 12 years clinically is if you get rid of this beat, if you ablate and target just this triggering PVC, then will there be a less likelihood of this patient getting ventricular fibrillation. This is from one of our, one of our early patients, a uh, very characteristic syndrome. This was just a regular 24 hour Holter monitor recording. So patient uh, had a history of multiple shocks, over 40 shocks from the defibrillator, multiple antiarrhythmic drug therapies, young, uh, patient and just recognizing these kind of PVCs that look similar from episode to episode with either short non-sustained arrhythmia, relatively more sustained arrhythmia, or on defibrillator tracings actually inducing ventricular fibrillation. This became the target for ablation. So where do these PVCs occurs. There are anything unique about PVCs that trigger ventricular fibrillation compared to PVCs in general that uh, so many patients have. So one key difference appears to be the location of origin of the PVCs. And there are several unique locations, but by far the most common location is actually very similar to another arrhythmia syndrome, which is entirely benign, but ventricular tachycardia arising from the conduction system, also called idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia. The VT is something that general clinicians, cardiologists should be aware of trying to diagnose just from the ECG. 
It's a recognizable syndrome. If we look at lead B1, it looks like right bundle branch block. There are some fusion beads here. So you may have recognized we're dealing with BT, but looks an awful lot like typical right bundle branch block. Very often the axis is superior, negative in two, three AVF. So right bundle pattern, although it's a VT, and you have two, three AVF negative. This is a common benign syndrome that uh, patients have, but serves a, to us as a way to recognize PVCs that may be originating from the same structures that give rise to this VT, and that is the cardiac conduction system. Now, of the cardiac conduction system, this is looking from the left ventricular aspect. So left bundle will be somewhere here, and then the main divisions of the left bundle, and then the Purkinje network. The most common location for the ventricular tachycardia, the benign variant, is the left posterior fascicle, the left posterior fascicle. But PVCs that arise, from the conduction system that can give rise to ventricular fibrillation. It's about half the time from branches of the left fascicle and then everywhere else in the Purkinje network constitute about the other half. But this looking almost like a conducted beat with bundle branch block, prototypical happening every single time before a polymorphic arrhythmia those would be the major tip-offs or clues that you may be dealing with the syndrome of trigger VF, PVCs trigger, triggering ventricular fibrillation. Now for the electrophysiologists, we'll recognize this kind of pattern. I'll just uh, show you. This is the ECG. These are the intracardiac tracings. And this is what the signal when we place a catheter near where the triggering PVC is, it shows actually two discrete electrical signals. The first is sharp and early and very typical diagnostic of conduction tissue. So we would see this in healthy conduction tissue. And the only reason we know that this is the site of the PVC is mapping the PVC. So not only does the patient need to have the syndrome recognized, but needs to actually have some of these PVCs in the procedure laboratory when the mapping and ablation procedure is done. Very often, just mechanical manipulation near that site and much more commonly when actually delivering ablative energy in that location, ventricular fibrillation will be induced and at times can even be very difficult to control without complete ablation at that location. Now, it's not just the left posterior fascicle in terms of PVC triggered ablation. It can even be in the right ventricular conduction system. It could even be in some parts of the conduction system that relay conduction information, uh, the wavefront from the septum to the free wall, intracavitary structures that go from the septum to the free wall, sometimes called false tendons and in the right ventricle, the moderator band. Now in the EP laboratory, the various types of mapping systems are used very similar to our approaches with traditional PVCs, except often requiring slightly different mapping methods or thought processes because these PVCs either are not that common or they induce ventricular fibrillation, so our op opportunity for taking our time and mapping is much less. One of the things that we also recognize in the EP laboratory is that there may be many different PVCs on the day of mapping. So having the defibrillator still recording the PVCs that we're seeing on the day of ablation and then comparing that with the PVCs that induced ventricular fibrillation is one way of knowing which is the target of interest. Now, one of the most difficult issues with ablation of the syndrome is that when we do ablate, we can induce ventricular fibrillation. 
And this ventricular fibrillation can be incessant, uh, at times requiring multiple shocks on the day uh, of the ablation. And sometimes the syndrome is so severe that we'll have to think about measures like supporting the circulation uh, in order to get the patient through this period of time. Now, there are about 10% of these PVC locations that with the PVC that causes ventricular fibrillation, we don't see that characteristic signal. But when we look at sinus beats, there is a site of conduction tissue present in that location, but just might be a little deeper or activated differently during the time of the PVC. And when such a pattern is seen, what's been now clearly recognized is a disproportionate number of PVCs that trigger ventricular fibrillation occur from the papillary muscles. So this syndrome was uh, described now about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, much like PVCs or VT that can occur from the papillary muscles, but because there is this admixture of myocardium and conduction tissue on the papillary muscle, it's also a source of ventricular fibrillation. Now, this is true in patients with structurally normal hearts, and it is more true or more likely to be a culprit in patients with mitral valve prolapse, especially bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, large uh, degrees of redundancy uh, in large myxomatous valves. The papillary muscles themselves are often the site of PVCs per se and PVCs that trigger ventricular fibrillation in those patients. The papillary muscles can be ablated. This was an early example um, that uh, you can target for ablation without damaging the papillary muscle and can stop the PVCs and as a sequelae, stop the triggering PVC that produces ventricular fibrillation. This is another very different location. This is a ECG pattern that most cardiologists are familiar with. This is the most common type of ventricular tachycardia in normal hearts, a benign syndrome of outflow tract VT. Here, the pattern is different. You have a left bundle branch block-like pattern signifying origin from the right ventricle. And then the axis is inferior, starting in the outflow tract and the wavefront moving to the feet. So leads two, three AVF are all positive. Now, by and large, this is a benign syndrome. Ablation is very successful in eliminating the arrhythmia, as also are beta blockers, as well as calcium channel blockers in patients who don't undergo ablation. But occasionally, the same common location can be a site of origin for PVCs that trigger ventricular fibrillation. And in that circumstance, it may not be a discrete focus, but some tissue around an area that requires more extensive ablation, these red dots to, uh, showing ablation points compared to a more pinpoint map associated ablation in the right ventricular outflow tract. Now, Sometimes the origin of a triggering PVC is actually not in the heart. This is a type of a color-coded map where the focus, the very first site of activation during a PVC is this little white circle, and then the spreading colors of the rainbow until you get to these late activated purple sites. And if you notice that white spot is actually above the level of the pulmonary valve. And these are likely origin from muscle that extends, cardiac syncytial muscle that extends above the plane of attachment of the pulmonary valve. Presumably that uh, PVCs from this location are like from a cul-de-sac of the heart. When they exit to get to the rest of the heart, they have differing pathways much like the conduction system, having different pathways to get to the myocardium and uh, maybe why this site 
is uh, perhaps the second most common location for finding triggering PVCs for ventricular fibrillation. Sometimes there may be a clue in the type of VT that the patient has, not just PVCs, but some change in morphology. Overall axis looks the same, but slight changes in coupling interval and morphology uh, in these patients who have outflow triggered ventricular fibrillation. Now, in terms of why would the outflow tract be a site um, in the developing heart, there's very little difference between the outflow tract and the Purkinje network typical locations in the flow portion of the ventricle. We have similar conduction system, kind of like a right superior fascicle or a left superior fascicle on the left side. And these regress to varying extent in different individuals before birth. Sometimes these little tracks remain called dead end tracks. And often in patients who have VF from triggering PVCs in this location, you do notice um, a, an origin signal very similar to conduction system in the uh, usual location. Sometimes multiple signals that look like conduction signals will be seen before the PVCs. Now, another, maybe the third common location for this that we pick up during stress tests. So the story will be a patient went down, was resuscitated, may have gotten a ICD already placed or may be in the process of evaluation and may get a stress test as part of that evaluation. Now, coronaries are normal and it's not ischemia, but with stress, you start getting PVCs, generally one morphology, similar morphology, then two, then three, and then start getting polymorphic runs, and then the exercise test is terminated. Now, when these patients are mapped, especially young patients with normal hearts with this syndrome, the origin of the polymorphic arrhythmia and triggering PVCs is the structure called the moderator band. You're all familiar with this from imaging, but this moderator band is actually a little channel way that's coated with muscle, but carries the right bundle branch right from the septum to the free wall. It's a kind of synchrony inducing structure for the right ventricle. And it is the mirror image or equivalent of the left posterior fascicle, just has this more discrete recognized uh, structure. Uh, ablation can be challenging in these cases because of contact of the catheter on this band, but when accomplished, results are very similar to trigger ablation for VF on the left side as well. Now, one of the things when counseling patients that's very important is that some kind of support, hemodynamic support should be available. It either could be talking to a surgeon and saying, we're doing this VF ablation. If we run into intractable VF, we may need to think about ECMO. We may need to think about uh, uh, assist devices or a percutaneous pump that, uh, that's uh, available in the cath lab. Now in patients who are in an acute VF syndrome, I might place this ahead of time before doing the ablation, but usually a backup option if, if it's needed. So that's kind of the story for trigger. So is there a substrate? In other words, is there an underlying recognizable problem in the heart itself regardless of whether you see the trigger that's characteristic of ventricular fibrillation. Is there a modulator that we can target for ablation? So these are the two, I would say, present contemporary questions that are being addressed through trials and research. The modulation piece is a little bit easier to understand, I think, uh, and I'll cover that first. 
And much like modulatory factors in the rest of the body, it's the autonomic nervous system. And there is uh, no question that several arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation and likely ventricular fibrillation, can be prominently modified when we modify the autonomic nervous system. And in fact, till date, the best treatment for a ventricular fibrillation storm is complete beta blockade if the patient can tolerate it. So to explore this, various targets of the autonomic nervous system have been studied, changing from spinal cord level to the sympathetic chain, as well as to the cardiac sympathetic nerves. The most, uh, the uh, other arm of the uh, autonomic system, the vagus nerve has also been studied, but clinically the best results appear to be either surgical or ablative management of the sympathetic nerves to the heart. Surgically, this can be addressed at the level of the sympathetic chain, the stellate ganglion, and an ablation potentially with the ganglia closer to the heart. So the sympathetic chain itself is kind of like a modulatory site with traffic that goes both with efferents and afferents, kind of coordinating multiple afferent sites with finally the blood vessels and the heart. And uh, early approaches now 30 years ago for some specific polymorphic arrhythmia syndrome like long QT that's triggered with exercise uh, has been surgical sympathectomy. And while this has not been that much of value as a standalone therapy, uh, for ventricular fibrillation uh, prevention, it is extreme, can be extremely useful in some patients who are in, having a storm of ventricular fibrillation, can't get enough beta blockade on, including in the EP lab, where a bedside block uh, with one, someone from anesthesia or pain to the stellate ganglion can be potentially life-saving in some patients. Some very novel approaches are also being uh, looked at uh, where uh, distant sites, the renal nerves, the pelvic splanchnic nerves, including a procedure that was actually described by an orthopedic surgeon who noticed changes during some orthopedic procedures with cardiac rhythm and blood pressure to for at a distance autonomic modulation to decrease the chance of ventricular fibrillation. So modulators, really it's autonomic modulation, probably a kind of uh, rescue therapy during ventricular fibrillation storms. But substrate is really the most intensive area of study and research, since if bad substrate, the bad soil can be removed, then you are potentially rendering that heart ventricular fibrillation proof. So what do we know about substrate for ventricular fibrillation? Now, I think one of the things is that was recognized early in this research process is ventricular tachycardia substrate and ventricular fibrillation substrate are very different. Very simple way to kind of uh, explain this is in a normal heart, it's very difficult, almost impossible to induce ventricular tachycardia. Something has to be wrong. Usually it's a scar, it's some slow conducting zone, or occasionally some inborn disorders of cardiac conduction and recovery. But ventricular fibrillation can be induced in any heart. In fact, anyone here in the audience uh, if you give Jordan about 10 minutes of your time and access to your femoral vein, he will have you in ventricular fibrillation. So I think the message from that is whatever that substrate is that allows ventricular fibrillation to occur, it's something all of us have. So as a result of that, some structures were kind of systematically studied and various types of research, optical mapping studies, real heart mapping studies, uh, uh, mapping in patients who have existing LVADs 
has all come down to the Purkinje network. There are some other candidate sites that are still actively explored, but the vast majority suggests that the same structure that was giving rise to the most common trigger may be what's necessary for maintaining ventricular fibrillation as yet. A very old study at that time from uh, Dr. Berenfeld that was unrecognized, I think, in, in terms of its value, uh, was a very elegant description of this role of the Purkinje. This is an optical map study that's done with a heart that's kept alive or kept beating. And what it showed is even though there's a chaotic rhythm, there was a gradient the rapid or most malignant rhythm began from the endocardial aspect and then went towards the epicardium. And we know the Purkinje network is an almost exclusively endocardial structure just underneath the endocardium. So the next step in their experiments that they did is they gave Lugol's iodine, which tends to kill the Purkinje network with little or no effect on the ventricular muscle. And once that was done, it was not possible to induce ventricular fibrillation. You could still, if there were scars, ischemia in the heart, get ventricular tachycardia, but no ventricular fibrillation. And subsequent studies from various groups with more uh, number of these studies over the last five or six years have targeted in other, either large animal models, beating heart models, or in patients who have an LVAD to try and ablate the Purkinje network and see what happens with inducibility or threshold for getting ventricular fibrillation. Now, the problem with an approach, even if this is the cause for substrate for ventricular fibrillation, is the Purkinje network is widespread. Even though three-dimensionally, it's mainly in the endocardium, there's no one location or two locations so it would require a tremendous amount of ablation. So other approaches have been kind of looked at to see can the Purkinje network be targeted to prevent it from being the substrate for ventricular fibrillation, but without necessarily burning it or ablating it with some other method. So for biological approaches, one of the things that had to be kind of identified very distinctly, and which is presently the state of the art in terms of research in the area, is distinguishing with high degree of certainty the Purkinje network from the underlying muscle biologically, and then figuring out what could be more upstream approaches to target the, the, uh, the Purkinje network. Most experiments have looked at just uh, the Langendorf model, beating heart, keeping the heart alive, recording signals from Purkinje network, like the signals we saw in the patients who had the trigger syndrome, uh, studying this tissue and seeing what's different compared to the myocardium. There are many uh, candidate genes, some of the heavy chain myosin genes, as well as atrial natriuretic peptide that are found in the Purkinje, but not in ventricular myocardium. And the goal of this therapy is to use this as a visualizable, visualizing tool for the Purkinje network and eventually for targeted uh, therapies to ablate the Purkinje fibers. Now, the last concept that I'll go through and then we'll go through some questions is if there is a way to ablate the Purkinje network, wouldn't that give rise to heart block? Wouldn't that give rise to severe dyssynchrony? And the answer uh, is at this point unknown, but perhaps not. And the reason is our conduction system is actually of two types one which is insulated, here coded in red, the his bundle itself, the bundle branches, and the fascicles, and some of the early Purkinje or cross fascicle fibers. Now this insulated portion of the conduction system does not appear to be involved 
in the generation of ventricular fibrillation. It can be for PVCs, it can be for VT, but not for ventricular fibrillation. It's this uninsulated, redundant, interlocking Purkinje network that appears to be the key player. So if approaches can leave this insulated portion alone, either because of its biophysical properties or biological properties, and target the more distal Purkinje network, then we may have some way to offer our patients in the future an ablative therapy, not just for triggers like we try to identify and ablate now, but for substrate as well. Now, two newer approaches I'll just briefly mention, and we can discuss more if questions come up, is a topic I uh, presented and uh, discussed with the EP group yesterday, a new ablation modality called electroporation, where direct current is pulsed and pulsed at a frequency and strength that doesn't heat tissue. So it's not a thermal ablation and has a benefit that you can do test ablations. So ablate and see, do we make a difference? What's the minimum amount that we need to ablate to make a difference and then do more permanent ablation using the same technology, but with a different delivery option. And many of you have also uh, heard about for ventricular tachycardia, ablation using radiation sources that target uh, slow conducting areas, scar tissue in ventricular tachycardia. There's a more refined type of approach using heavy particle uh, radiation, for example, carbon beam radiation, that's much more precise, uh, order of like 10 power four more precise in localization that has the inherent capability of targeting just a layer like the endocardial layer rather than the mid-myocardial layer that uh, may be a way of doing ablation uh, in patients for triggers as well as for substrate for ventricular fibrillation. So to summarize, um, the ventricular fibrillation patient almost always will have protection from the de a defibrillator that's implanted. Almost always, we all strive hard with general cardiology care, ischemia, um, uh, structural care, trying to identify mechanical triggers, valve issues to prevent VF. But despite doing all of that, we have a large number of patients who continue to get episodes and get shocks. For the general cardiologists, today's practice very important to recognize the syndrome of PVC-triggered ventricular fibrillation. Just frequent PVCs is usually not enough to recognize the syndrome, but either with reviewing the device or on some uh, monitoring that's done on the patient, recognizing there is this transition beat. This is a high yield type patient for minimizing future shocks by ablating. We also should be aware of approaches with the autonomic nervous system and substrate-based approaches that may be better defined for uh, patients in the future to truly minimize to the point of perhaps making ventricular fibrillation unlikely to happen in the future. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Sam. That, that's uh, great. I, um, as always, learned so much from you. Uh, let me start while uh, other people, if you want to put in any questions um, into the chat or the um, question and answer box. Um, have you ever done an ablation for catecholaminergic polymorphic VT? It, it would seem like that would be a similar sort of substrate in terms of the Purkinje triggers for this, or is it even coming from the Purkinje? System? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, as far as I can remember, I've only attempted it uh, three times. And uh, the, last, the last procedure was over 10 years ago. So um, it, it was very difficult. Uh, it, it was uh, multiple sites in those patients. Uh, there are anecdotes of ablation where the conduction system was targeted, 
But the reason we don't really offer it that much to patients now is uh, sympathectomy is really uniquely effective for the syndrome. So like in, uh, uh, in the patients who are not um, benefited from just beta blockers alone or continue to have episodes, it's very rare after surgical sympathectomy, stellate ganglion level, that uh, you need to do something else. But it is uh, uh, attempt unsuc unsuccessful attempts in the past, mm -hmm. uh, personal experience. And again, for others, you can put in questions in the chat. Oh, it looks like we have a couple here from Nazem uh, and Melissa. So I'll start with Nazem's. Uh, thanks again for the amazing lecture. Uh, VF is often the presenting rhythm for acute coronary syndromes associated cardiac arrest. Is the outliner system involved in a similar fashion to idiopathic VF? Yes, yeah, so the question here is, um, if you have a patient who has clear-cut ischemia, and you trigger VF or polymorphic VT syndrome we're all familiar with, is there a role for the Purkinje network? And it's, uh, it's the Purkinje network is probably the most resistant to ischemia uh, in the heart. It has its own glycogen type stores, uh, unlike myocardium and can resist ischemia, it can resist severe hyperkalemia and stay alive longer than other tissue. So what happens in acute ischemia is any part of the heart can get VF just because of repolarization changes. But if you continue to get VF, even after you've got, uh, after you've got uh, a, uh, the ischemic event is over, it's usually this remaining tissue that's responsible, which is often the Purkinje. And in fact, even with ventricular tachycardia, some of the complex signals that we see amidst scar is not always myocardium. Uh, usually there is surviving Purkinje fibers in that location as well. Uh, Melissa uh, Robinson asked, is there a role of imaging in defining proximity of the conduction system to substrate, specifically in ischemic cardiomyopathy? MIBG scans, for instance, with nuclear perfusion or CT, and would that proximity predict arrhythmogenesis? Yeah, at this point, at this point, I'm not aware of any imaging modality that you can identify uh, Purkinje tissue. So there are some uh, studies that identified Purkinje by some other reason, like uh, with direct mapping, biological approaches, and then did CT reconstructions to show their pattern. Like, do they go into the papillary muscle? Do they reach the mitral valve? Things like that. But uh, one of these approaches that uh, looks at some of the heavy chain protein tagging or co-tagging with ANP, and then using some kind of luminescence for uh, visualization is an investigational method to try to identify and visualize the Purkinje network. The idea is this would be given to patients and then just like we use intracardiac echo, we'd be using some light sensitive device to try to identify where these structures are located. But uh, MIBG has been investigated and there's been some variations of MRI like uh, tractography, tract-based imaging to try and see, can you predict where conduction tissue is? And it has not been possible as far as I know. Uh, Alex Taylor, uh, one of our fellows, uh, th thank you for the excellent talk. Can you speak a bit more about when you pursue per percutaneous stellate ganglion blockade? So in the EP lab as such, the times we try to keep this as an option is if while we're ablating, we're starting to see a lot of VF and it's kind of, you get VF, you shock, you get a surge, catecholamine surge, you're getting VF again, uh, threshold to reach for ultrasound guided stellate block is very low. Uh, the second is uh, unrelated to ventricular fibrillation. Sometimes patients have very difficult to treat atrial tachycardias because they have competing sinus tachycardia. And this gives some changing morphology. It's tough to map 
So then sometimes doing a stellate block will slow the sinus, right side stellate block will slow the sinus and allow you to map the atrial tachycardia better. The more common uh, scenario is in the ICU. So here the patient is admitted, they're having a lot of uh, shocks, you're intubated, they're sedated, it's still happening, blood pressure won't tolerate further sympathetic blockade, multiple PVCs are being seen, so may not be someone who will benefit uh, at that point from ablation, then uh, usually we'll try a bedside block, either ultrasound guided or fluoroscopy guided. Uh, typically would start with the left stellate, and if that's not helping or partial benefit, then the right stellate. Usually the benefit lasts about 48 to 72 hours. If it's dramatic, then this is a patient who could be considered for a surgical sympathectomy. Uh, Arun uh, Shridhar uh, asks here, thanks for the amazing lecture. As we know, VF comes in storms and then has long silent periods. How do you handle patients who are referred for VF storm and no longer have ongoing trigger PVCs when they are being planned for the lab? How do you handle it perioperatively and how do you handle induction in the lab? Yeah, so if I, if I get a patient like that, that who had a remote storm, so very common type of patient for evaluation, but has been doing fine, maybe six months, nothing is happening. Usually if it was one episode and then there's been some general management, say change in the beta blocker dose, treatment of ischemia, something that we feel might have made a difference, will not take the patient to the EP laboratory at that point. Now, if it's more proximate, few weeks ago it happened, most of the time you'll see some PVCs. Now, sometimes a drug, say like flecainide in patients who have structurally normal hearts but have VF, can be very effective in quelling these Purkinje PVCs, but has had a breakthrough. In those patients, you have to stop the flecainide, and that's very difficult to do. Patients will be very afraid to do it. I usually hospitalize the patients, uh, sometimes keeping them seven, eight days in the hospital, let this wear off slowly, see if we start seeing some PVCs, some uh, thing, hopefully not uh, VT or VF, and then uh, may do some bedside testing of some anesthetic agents as well, like uh, uh, low doses of propofol, uh, Versed, uh, in the, at the bedside in the ICU to see if, you know, is there an agent that's not suppressing the PVCs that have started coming back and using that in the P laboratory. There's really no good way to induce uh, PVCs most of the time, if you give enough of a catecholamine, uh, you will start seeing the syndrome in patients who are susceptible. But the flip side is it's very high risk. If you give a lot and uh, you start getting VF, it can be tough to get the patient out of VF. And I'm aware of some patients worldwide who have died on the table just because couldn't get them out of, out of ventricular fibrillation. So it's kind of like a sweet spot. You start seeing a couple of PVCs and that should be enough. Give you an idea which region in the conduction system and ablate and just let the patient know that this is not a curative approach. This was the best shot at this time. It's possible the syndrome will recur. If it is combining with the recorded tracings and a more urgent ablation, uh, might give a better result for the patient at that time. We typically go back to continuing the drugs that were helpful in the interim as well. So really don't think about those situations as a cure, but kind of minimizing shocks in the patients. Uh, thanks. Uh, Andrew Perry asks, are there patients with mitral valve prolapse for whom we should be considering primary ablation of PVCs prior to any history of uh, VF? Uh, so, you know, in terms of primary therapy with the ablation, the answer is no. Uh, and the reason is probably twofold. The, the arrhythmia syndrome isn't that well-defined. 
There's some nice characteristics that are panning out over time uh, for who with mitral valve prolapse gets uh, sudden death and ventricular fibrillation. Uh, kind of like a tetrad of bileaflet prolapse, then PVCs often with a short coupling interval, 200 to 240 milliseconds. Some uh, ECG abnormalities, abnormal T waves, and sometimes mitral annular disjunction. And uh, in addition, in patients who actually died and then had autopsy studies or correlative imaging studies from the explanted autopsy heart, uh, there's been growing data that there are MRI abnormalities, late gadolinium enhancement, sometimes the papillary muscle, sometimes the surrounding myocardium in these patients. But the denominator in terms of the question of someone who's never had an event, what's the accuracy, what's the value of each of these is unknown. Plus ablation itself can be arrhythmogenic. It could damage the mitral valve apparatus. So at the present time, you cannot justify a preventive or preemptive approach uh, in patients with mitral valve prolapse. Uh, Arun had another question. Uh, do you believe all VFs have trigger and substrate and we just have to look harder? Or are there truly VFs that do not have a trigger PVC at all? And if so, how do these VF in episodes initiate? Yes, no, without question, you can get VF without a trigger beat. No doubt about that. Multiple, multiple examples for decades to show that. And there are many mechanisms for that. The best established mechanism is a repolarization gradient. So there isn't exactly a PVC in our general sense, but what happens is there's enough of a difference in the resting potential in cells that are close enough to each other, either as a result of ischemia because of a repolarization syndrome or other provoking things like inflammation that uh, allow you to generate current from one cell to the other. And if this generates back again, because the repolarization level has now shifted from one cell to the other, you can get an after depolarization and then the beginning of ventricular fibrillation. So you don't have a PVC at other times. You don't have a recognizable PVC at this time. But in patients who don't have these acute processes, so there's no ischemia, there's no inflammatory process, there is no genetic disorder, there is no known repolarization disorder, vast majority of those patients have triggering PVCs. Uh, a question from uh, Malish Thompson. How does alteration of blood pressure or heart rate affect Purkinje arrhythmogenesis? So I'm not aware of any studies that look at it in that angle. That is, if you change the blood pressure, if you change the heart rate, what happens to the Purkinje? It's a very interesting question. But it appears that if you change the autonomic tone, then you have two bystander phenomena happening. So by changing the autonomic tone, you'll change the blood pressure, the heart rate, but you also affect arrhythmogenicity. Now, what's the mechanism for that direct effect of autonomic tone? Of a, it's best worked out in atrial fibrillation. It has to do with the autonomic balance, vagus and sympathetic on the retroatrial ganglia. And these in turn affect the action potential duration in the atrium. So if you get, for example, vagal uh, stimulation or ganglia stimulation, the action potential shortens. If it shortens with the retroatrial ganglia stimulation, if it shortens, you can fundamentally get a more rapid arrhythmia. The shorter the action potential duration, the faster the arrhythmia that's possible in that tissue. So corollary is if those ganglia are ablated, then you cannot shorten it and you cannot shorten it differently in different tissues. So you get less atrial fibrillation. 
Now, a similar mechanism is probably true for the ventricular muscle, but we don't have ventricular ganglia. We have only two, one near the circumflex coronary, one near the aortocaval junction, but not like the atria. So what the intermediary cells are between autonomics and cardiac muscle in the ventricle is investigational. One candidate type of cell is called the cardiac telocyte, very similar to the interstitial cells of Cajal that you get in the GI tract or in the nervous system. But such cells are present in the heart. They tend to be mid-myocardial, tend to be associated with the papillary muscles and may be a similar role to the cardiac ganglia. But it's like two different downstream effects that's at least present understanding from autonomic modulation, getting to the heart, and then by the way, doing something with the sinus node with the vascular smooth muscle. There may be an interaction between these two effector limbs also, but I don't think that's been studied very much. Uh, another question from Melissa Robinson. I'm impressed with Bill Stevenson's data that substrate mapping can lead to non-inducibility in VT, presumably via catheter bump of critical components. This is even more of a concern with the posterior fascicle in my experience and has led me to burn early, if you will, in these cases. Can you speak to the physical fragility of the hispercindy tissue and any techniques uh, to minimize this issue? I've not been impressed with non-contact mapping in the VF patient. Yeah, so this is more of an issue like for patients who have the benign syndrome of idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia have a discrete sites of origin, probably a localized reentry that we're mapping, we've induced VT, we can map, we ablate, but mechanically traumatize the tissue. Uh, so several reasons why these are so common to mechanically traumatize. One is the circuits involve the distal Purkinje and they are very endocardial, very superficial. Some components may be within the cavity itself, like false tendons or aberrant cords that just moving the catheter, you can bump and you can ablate. Now, usually we get away with good success, I think, in these patients, even when this happens, because just looking at the ECG gives us an idea of where the exit of this VT is. And since it's a localized reentry, somewhere in that region, uh, uh, more, slightly more extensive ablation than we do for focal origin arrhythmias uh, is often helpful in this, uh, in this patients. Uh, methods to minimize the chance of that happening. Uh, so one of the things that's useful for the left posterior fascicle, I think, is using a transeptal approach via the mitral valve. So there we're not prolapsing the catheter down, which is tough to control when we go retrograde aortic. So kind of getting it down, getting it to the lateral wall of the ventricle, and then using deflection to slowly bring it towards the septum. Uh, downside of this approach is we sometimes don't reach the septum. Very common cause of failure. We're actually hitting into a papillary muscle and think we're on the septum. Uh, and why intracardiac echo is uh, critical for ablation to know that you've actually reached the septum and you're in the region of this fascicle. Uh, well, it looks like we are essentially at 8.30 uh, now. So I just wanted to thank you so much, Sam, for uh, talking to us today as the Locke Lecturer. Uh, it's really just a pleasure uh, to have had you here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Nice to take care.